is our own Ned Monahan, who is back again by popular demand to give us another reading of Irish poetry in honor of and celebration of St. Patrick's Day. What I'm going to talk about and recite this morning is the poetry of William Butler Yeats. And before I begin, uh, just a few words on his, himself uh, and his time. He was born in 1865, one of the, call them the Protestant ascendancy, the people who did very well in Ireland. Uh, his mother was from County Sligo, and he went there a lot as a child uh, on vacation and felt the love. He, uh, as you all know, he was a famous poet. He got the Nobel Prize in 2000, uh, 1923. He was active politically. He became a senator in Ireland. Uh, he came from an, an artistic family. Now, uh, the quality of art can be measured. Uh, last week, uh, his brother, uh, Jack Yeats, famous painter, and one of his less famous paintings was being bought by the Irish uh, Fine Arts Museum for a million and a half euro. Uh, so uh, he was a fine painter and well regarded. Uh, Yeats' dad was a portrait painter. Uh, they lived in London and in Dublin, and he vacationed in Sligo, where he formed a bond. You know, where you are as a child and what you do as a child, you never do forget that he never did. So, <coughs> on religion, uh, he was between fences, so to speak. He was a nominal Protestant, but he was into esoteric Eastern stuff. Uh, and at the end of the show, there's a particularly lovely poem that he wrote about a priest doing good work in, in the time of the famine. So I think that's enough introduction. If I forgot anything, I'll remember it perhaps later in ten years. But right now, we'll get into the poems. The first one, this poem is uh, Fiddler of Dooney. What this poem says is that if you want to get to heaven, it, you might have a better chance of getting to heaven via music or dance or singing as compared with uh, reading religious books and prayers. I love this poem. When I play on my fiddle at Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. My brother's a priest in Kilbarnet, and my cousin in Mupper Hui. When I meet my brother and cousin, they read their book of prayer. I read from the book of songs that I bought at the Sligo Fair. When we come to the end of time and meet St. Peter sitting in state, we smile at the three old spirits. Would he wave me first through that gate? Lovely line at this point now, don't forget it. For the good are always the merry, saved by an evil chance. And the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there spy me, they'll all come up to me, saying, here's the fiddler of Dooney, and we'll dance like a wave of the sea. Now, uh, the next poem we'll have is a poem about the love of place, more particularly the love of where you were when you were a child. Uh, he wrote this poem, it's called Inish Free. Uh, he wrote this poem when he was 22 and living in London and thinking of Sligo, where he went on vacation as a child. This is perhaps his most famous poem. I will arise and go now, and go to Inish Free, the small cabin built there of clay and wattle made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and I will live alone in the bee-loved blaze. 
And I shall have some peace there. The peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veins of the morning to where the cricket sings. There, midnight's all a glimmer, and noon, a purple glow, and evening, full of the linnet's wing. I will rise and go now, for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. And as I stand on the roadway or on the pavement gray, I hear it in the deep heart's roar. I've always loved that poem. Now I'll read the notes I had that I was going to tell you guys before reading the poem, and see, in case I forgot anything. Thinking of Sligo from London, love of place, I think we've covered all that. Now, back in the day, say 1900 or so, there was a huge literary re revival in Ireland focusing on Irish-based literature, plays. They started the Abbey Theatre, and there was one woman, uh, she, her name was Lady Gregory. She married well. She married, I assume the guy was Lord Gregory, but I'm not sure on that detail. Uh, and they had a fabulous place uh, in the west of Ireland where <clears throat> all the poets would go and gather and compose. There's still at the place, there's a big copper beech tree where all their initials that were carved 120 years ago are, can still be read. I, I guess they're bigger initials now <laughs> since the tree presumably has grown. This poem that he wrote there is about, it's about What's it about? I guess it's about regret and loss. And I read the poem, and you guys decide what it's about. The trees are in their autumn beauty. The woodland paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors a clear sky. Upon the brimming water, among the stones, are nine and fifty swans. The nineteenth autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw before I had well finished all suddenly mountains scattered, wheeling in great broken rings upon their clamorous wings. I have looked upon those brilliant creatures, and now my heart is sore. All is changed since I, hearing at twilight the first time on this shore, the bell beat of their wings above my head with a lighter tread. Unwearied still, lover by lover, they paddle in the cold companionable streams or climb the air. Their hearts have not grown old. Passion or conquest, wander where they will, attend upon them still. But now they drift on the still water, mysterious, beautiful. Among what rushes will they build? By what lake's edge or pool delight men's eyes? When I awake some day to find they have flown away. Now we're going to get into the fairies next. <laughs> fairies are very lightweight creatures. They do only good. There's only one downside to fairies, and that is they they tend to steal children. No. <laughs> uh, based on my personal experience, that might not always be a bad idea. <laughs> That's not intended for you, Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, I know it back here. But uh, they are obviously mythical creatures, but there are poems written about them. And uh, somebody else wrote a lovely poem to give you the flavor of what fairies are like. And he said, up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go hunting for fear of little men. They were the fairies. <laughs> but anyhow, the name of this poem is The Stolen Child, and it has a sad ending. This is just advanced information. <laughs> and uh, lovely nature pictures in this poem as well. Where dips the rocky highland of Sleuthwood in the lake, there lies a leafy island where flapping hounds wake the drowsy water rats. There we've hid our fairy vats, full of berries and of reddest stolen come away, O oh human child, to the waters of the wild, with fairy hand in hand, in a world more full of weeping than you can understand. 
where the wave of moonlight glosses the dim gray sands with light. Far off by farthest crosses, we put it all the night, weaving olden dances, mingling hands and mingling glances, till the moon has taken flight. To and fro we leap and chase the frothy bubbles while the world is full of troubles and is anxious in its sleep. Where the wandering water gushes from the hills above Glen Carr, in pools among the rushes that scarce could bathe the star, we seek for slumbering cult, and whispering in their ears give them unquiet dreams, leaning softly out from ferns that drop their tears over the young tree. Come away, O human child, to the waters in the wild, with a fairy, hand in hand, for the world is more full of weeping than you can understand. And now the sad part. Away with us he's going, this solemn eyed. He'll hear no more the lowing of the calves on the warm hillside, or the kettle in the ho on the hob sing peace into his breast, or see the brown mice bob round and round the oatmeal chest. For he comes, the human child, to the waters of the wild, with a fairy, hand in hand, from a world more full of weeping than he can understand. That is sad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, further on with the fairies, they're still in action in the next poem, where two famous people, Dermot and Gronje, um, they had a romance and they died afterwards. It was very sad. We won't go into the details. But at their grave, the fairies gathered, and they all sang fairy songs. <laughs> and there's a poem about it called, appropriately <clears throat> enough, A Fairy Song. <laughs> we who are old, old and gay, oh, so old, thousands of years, thousands of years, if all were told, give to these children new from the world <clears throat> silence and love. And the long dew-dropping hours of the night of the stars above. Give to these children a new from the world a rest far from men. Is anything better, anything better, tell us it then. Us, who are old, old and gay, oh so old. Thousands of years, thousands of years, if all we were told. My now, Yeats fell madly in love with a woman, Maul Gone was her name, when he was young and foolish. Um, I guess nobody here has been young and foolish. We've all been young, but we've never been foolish. Is that correct? <laughs> I doubt it. But he fell madly in love with Maul Gone. She was a, a famous character. She was a, an aristocratic very wealthy English woman who came to Ireland around 1900 and, and moved her political allegiance from the status quo, which was Ireland and England, one country, to the rebel side, which says, hey, we need independence here. Now, she was stunningly beautiful, and uh, it didn't work out with Yeats. She ended up marrying one of the rebel characters who was executed, McBride was his name, he was ex executed in 1916. Uh, their son uh, got a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, in the 50s. Uh, John McBride was his name, and uh, was a minister for state, which is like a head of a government department in Ireland. So she was famous. But this poem now, is, the first one is done by the Sally Garden. It's a lovely song as well. Dig it out of YouTube. Is that where you get the songs? Yeah, YouTube. And this is a poem of regret, it's sweet regret. Down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She passed the Sally Gardens with little snow white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the tree. But I, being young and foolish, with her, would not agree. 
In a field by the river, my love and I did stand, and on my leaning shoulder she laid her snow white hand. She bid me take life easy as the grass grows on the weirs. But I was young and foolish, and now I'm full of tears. And he meant it. This is another sweet little poem, a sweet sad memory of Maud might be a better name for the poem. It's called The Falling of the Leaves. Autumn is over the long leaves that love us, and over the mice in the barley sheaves. Yellow the leaves of the rowan above us, and yellow the wet wild strawberry leaves. The hour of the waning of love has beset us, and weary and worn are our sad souls now. Let us part, ere the season of passion forget us, with a kiss and a tear on thy drooping brow. Now, next up is a very interesting poem. It's a poem about when they'd be old, written when he was young. And it's lovely. When you're old and gray, and full of sleep, nodding by the fire, take down this book and dream, and take down this book and slowly read, and dream of the soft look your eyes had once, and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace, and loved your beauty with love false or true, but one man loved with the pilgrim soul in you, and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled, and paced among the mountains overhead, and hid his face amid a cloud of stars. Above. Now, this is another Thank You Maud poem coming up. This is a lovely poem as well. Of course, I'm biased, so you got to find I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry on a thread. And when white moths were all about and moths like stars, or when, when, when white moths were on the wing and moth like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in the street. Silver cup. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame. Something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair, who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone, and kiss her lips and hold her hand, and walk among long dappled grass, and pluck in time the tides of her down, the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples. Well, that is lovely stuff. Now, this is another poem of regret. It was good on regret, wasn't it? <laughs> it's, this is a lovely one, too. It's called Broken Dreams. <coughs> there is gray in your hair. Young men no longer suddenly catch their breath when you are passing. But maybe 
small gaffer, mutters the blessing, because it was your prayer recovered him upon the bed of death for your soul's sake. But all hearts ache have known and given to others all hearts ache from meager girlhoods putting on burdensome beauty for your soul's sake. Heaven has put away the stroke of her doom, so great her portion in that peace you make by merely walking in a room. The poet, stubborn with his passion, sang us when age might well have chilled his blood. Vague memories, nothing but memories. But in the grave all, all shall be renewed. The certainty that I shall see that lady leaning or standing or walking in the first loveliness of womanhood and with the fervor of my youthful eyes has set me muttering like a fool in heaven. The last stroke of midnight dies, all day in the one chair. From dream to dream and rhyme to rhyme, <coughs> I have ranged in rambling talk with an image of air, vague memories, nothing but memories. God, he had it bad, didn't he? <laughs> he he really did. Can't you see the pain in his poems? Now, this is a very interesting poem for me now. It's called Adam's Curse. And what he says in this poem is that making poetry is not easy. Um, art is not easy. Love is not easy. All are hard work. And all presumably well worth it in the end. We sat together at one summer's end, that beautiful, mild woman, your close friend, and you and I, and talked of poetry. I said, a line will take us hours, maybe, yet if it does not seem a moment's thought, our stitching and unstitching has been naught. Better go down upon your marrow bones and scrub a kitchen pavement or break stones like an old pot in all kinds of weather. But to articulate sweet sounds together is to work harder than all these, and yet be taught an idler by the noisy set of bankers, schoolmasters, and clergymen the martyrs call the world. And thereupon, that beautiful mild woman, for whose sake there's many a one shall find out all heartache on finding that her voice is sweet and low, replied, to be born a woman is to know although they do not talk of it at school, that we must labor to be beautiful. I said, it's certain there is no fine thing since Adam's fall, but needs much laboring. There have been lovers who thought love should be so much compounded of high courtesy that they would sigh and quote with learned looks precedence out of beautiful old books. Now it seems an idle trade enough. We sat grown quiet in the name of love. We saw the last embers of daylight die, and in the trembling blue-green of the sky a moon, worn as if it had been a shell, washed by time's waters as they rose and fell about the stars and broke in days and years. <coughs> I had a thought for no one's but your ears, you were beautiful, and that I strove to love you in the old high way of love, that it had all seemed happy, and yet we grown as weary hearted as that hollow moon, my mind. <coughs> Still unmoved, this is advice to the love lord, a sweet little poem. Listen to the words. Never give all the heart, for love will hardly seem worth thinking of to passionate women, if it seems certain, and they never dream that it fades out from kiss to kiss, for every hint that's lovely is but a brief, dreamy, kind delight. Oh, never give the heart outright, for they, for all the smooth lips can say, have given their hearts up to the fray, and who could play it well enough if deaf and dumb and blind with love? He made this, knows all the 
cost, but he gave out his heart to be lost for God. For God. But and Mark gone in discussions later with the AIDS, obviously he kept trying to get back together. He asked her, he asked her to marry him about two or three times, and she said no consistently. Uh, and he then uh, said, well, I'll try her out, but she also said no. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> we're getting to the end of the romantic section. Now, this is, this is advice again. This is not a sweet poem. Fasten your hair with a golden pin and bind up every wandering tress. I bade my heart build these poor rhymes. It worked at them day out and day in, building a sorrowful loveliness out of the battles of old times. You need to lift a pearl pale hand or bind up your long hair and sigh but all men's hearts must burn and beat and candlelight foam on the dim sand and stars climbing up the dew dropping sky live but to light your passing feet it was fond of her you could tell couldn't you <laughs> another love poem which is very, very nice. It's called The Sorrow of Love. There seems to be so much pain in all these love, and yet they're worth reading. The brawling of a sparrow in the eaves, the brilliant moon, and all the milky sky, and all that famous harmony of leaves had blotted out man's image and his cry. A girl arose that had red, mournful lips and seemed the greatness of the world in tears doomed like Odysseus of the laboring ships, and proud as Priam, murdered with his peers, arose, and on the instant clamorous eaves, a climbing moon upon an empty sky, and all that lamentation of the leaves could but compose man's image and his cry. One great thing about that poem, you're not quite sure what it means, but it really sounds good. This, this is a, a, one of the shortest romantic poems. Wine comes in at the mouth, and love comes in at the eye. That's all we shall know for truth before we grow old and die. <laughs> I lift the glass to my mouth, I look at you, and I sigh. Poor guy. <laughs> Anyhow. I think we're moving out of the mournful section of this presentation now. Um, uh, Lady Gregory, I said earlier on, was one of the people who organized the Irish literary revival. And uh, she had a son, Robert Gregory. He, he was a famous pilot in, in, in the First War. He was comparable, I guess, to the Red Baron. And near the end of the war, he was killed. He had... Uh, he had a daughter, Anne Gregory was her name, and uh, Yeats wrote a nice, nice poem about uh, the granddaughter. Never shall a young man, it's called For Anne Gregory, never shall a young man thrown into despair by those great honey-colored ramparts at your ear love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. But I can get a hair dye and set such color there, a black or a, a brown, a carrot, that young men in despair may love me for myself alone and not my yellow hair. <laughs> I met an old religious man, which yesternight declared that he had found a text to prove that only God, my dear, could love you for yourself alone and not your, your yellow hair. Now, we're moving on a little bit his political poems. For quite a while in Ireland, it was impossible to say anything that might be construed as seditious. So, anytime you wanted to write a poem about help from Spain, you talk about getting aid from Spain, and, and that was how it was fitted. Uh, this is a poem he wrote in, in that fashion. Uh, Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan, was a metaphor, a fake name, or whatever you want to call it, for Ireland. It's called 
red hammerheads sawn above Ireland. The old brown thorn trees break in two high over common strand under a bitter black wind that blows from the left hand. Our courage breaks like an old tree in the black wind and dies, but we have it hidden in our hearts, the flame out of the eyes of Kathleen, the daughter of Fuller. The wind has bundled up the clouds high over Martin Array and thrown the thunder on the stones for all that maid can say. Angers that are like noisy clouds have set our hearts a beat, and we have all bent low and kissed the quiet feet of Kathleen, the daughter of Fuller. The yellow pool has overflowed high up on Plute and the bar, for the wet winds are blowing out of the clinging air. Like heavy flooded waters, our bodies are about blood, but purer than a tall canyon before the holy rood is Kathleen, the daughter of the pool. Mm -hmm. Now, back on to Lady Gregory, after her son died at the end of the war. Now, a little about the historical context there. 1418 war went from 1914 to 18. The Big Irish Rebellion was 1916. He was killed in 18. So there was a lot of, call it political confusion, ambivalence around that time. And uh, it's reputed after a reported rather that Yeats did write this poem, a famous lovely poem, uh, called An Irish Airman Foresees His Death. But if you listen to the words, uh, the Irish Airman, in the poem doesn't seem to be committed to fighting them Germans and killing them. And he thought of home as County Galway. Listen to the words. It's called An Irish Airman Foresees His Death. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. My country is Kiltartan's cross. My countrymen, Kiltartan's poor. No likely end could bring them loss, nor leave them happier than before. No law nor duty bade me fight, <clears throat> nor public men, but cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed a waste of breath, a waste of breath, the years behind. In balance with this life, this death. You can see why Lady Gregory might not be too happy with that poem, but it is a lovely poem. Now, interestingly now, around 1916, there was a big rebellion, and the political momentum changed in Ireland. There were 15 people executed the week after, and it turned the country against Britain. Up until then, they wanted home rule, that is, uh, Parliament in Dublin instead of London. They were one country, it had been since 1800. Uh, uh, and at that time, after all the slaughter, Yeats's political inclinations leaned towards the nationalists, the people who rebelled. People who rebelled were not fancy people. They were schoolmasters, they were poets. In fact, Pierce, you can look it up on the internet, it's very touching. Pierce was the leader of the group, he was shot. But <clears throat> he wrote a poem for his mother the night before <clears throat> he was executed. So get on Wikipedia, public Pierce, and read the poem. He also wrote a nice letter to him. The name of this poem is Easter 1916, about the rebellion. I, I, I shortened it. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among gray 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said, life meaningless words and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire of the club being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn all is changed changed utterly a terrible beauty is born too long
all the sacrifice to make a stone of the heart old, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part, our part, to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that have run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all, for England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream, and not to know they dream and are dead. And what excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse. Macdonough and Macbride and Connolly and Pierce. Now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, all are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. <coughs> this was a lovely short poem. Okay, love, good to see you. Thanks for coming. Now, Bob, you've got to go to work, not like me. This, this, uh, this is a sweet, lovely poem. Again, looking back at what he missed, even though he achieved pretty much everything anybody would want to achieve, fame, Nobel Prize, Senate and the Parliament. This is from the heart. It's called politics. How can I, that girl standing there, my attention fix on Roman or on Russian or on Spanish politics? Yet, <clears throat> here's a traveled man that knows what he talks about. And there's a politician that has both read and thought. And maybe what they say is true of war and wars and arms. But oh, I were young again, held her in my arms. Pain, pain, pain. Now we're going to have the jolly section now. There's been too much pain already. The next poem is all smiles and happiness. Uh, it's, it's not true, but it's a poem, so it's entitled not to be true. Uh, this poem is about a priest back in famine time who people were dying, huge mortality. And priests would have to go out and give the last blessings and whatever to the poor people who died. Well, this priest was cold one day, but didn't he fall asleep, forgot to go out. And then he finally woke up, feel what well, he galloped out, he got to the house, and the woman said, Oh, you come again. The story being, of course, that somebody very nice up there had sent somebody very nice down to be the priest and to take care of the man. And there's a story behind this poem, too, of course. I've known this since I was a kid. I was reciting it in the car, going up Main Street, about, oh God, 30, 35 years ago. And the two children were, as two children tend to be, they were fighting in the back. You know, the line on the middle of the back, my side, your side. <laughs> and what I decided to do, to, to, I stopped the car. There was nothing behind, so I stopped the car right in the middle of the road like that. And, and, and that brought order to the back seat, and it allowed me to finish the poem. Uh, the old priest, Peter Gilligan, was weary, night and day, for half his flocks were in their bed, or under green sods lay. Once, while he nodded on a chair at the mop hour bee, another sick man said, he began to read. I have no rest but joy and peace for people who die and die. And after, cried he, Lord, forgive, my body spake, not I. Not a very good excuse. <laughs> he knelt and leaning on the chair, he prayed, fell asleep. And the moth hour went to the field stars began to peep. They slowly into millions grew, and leaves shook in the wind, and God covered the world with shade, and whispered to mankind. Upon the time of sparrow chirp, when the moths come once more, the old priest Peter Gilead stood upright on the floor. Of Rome, of Rome, that man has died while I slept on that chair. He roused, he roused his horse out of the sleep, and he rode with little care. 
He wrote now as he never wrote. He was walking today and said, <clears throat> the sick man's wife opened the door. Father, you come again? Uh, sorry, I missed the first page. And is the poor man dead? He cried. He died an hour ago. The old priest, Peter Gilligan, entry, rocked to and fro. When you were gone, he turned and died, as merry as a bird. And the old priest, Peter Gilligan, tells him at that word. He who hath made the night of stars for souls to tire and bleed, sent one of his great angels down to help me in my need. He who is wrapped in purple robes with planets in his care had pity on the least of kings asleep I have a feeling we're almost there. Uh, Yeats died in Paris, and uh, the body was brought back and buried in the churchyard, in County Sligo, Drumcliff <coughs> Churchyard. I remember clearly, I was there in 1960, I had a picture of the headstone, and it's still at home. I, I know what's on the headstone. I'll give you his last, the, the little verse, to do his own epitaph. Let's get the word right. This is his self-written epitaph. Under bare Ben Bulban's head, Ben Bulban is a mountain nearby. In Drumcliff Churchyard, Yeats is laid. An ancestor was rector there long years ago. A church stands near. By the road, an ancient cross. No barber. No conventional phrase on limestone quarried near the spot. By his command, these words are cut. Cast a cold eye on life and death. Horsemen, pass by. There we are. Thank you all for coming. Aww. Aww.